that occasion, I met many people who had become lifelong friends, one of whom was Andrei Trubakov. Others included Lev Yoffe uh, and uh, Anatoly Larkin. Um, uh, so anyway, it's with great pleasure that uh, uh, I introduced Andre today, who's going to tell us about the twists and turns of superconductivity from repulsive interactions. And Andre has promised to provide uh, 30 minutes for uh, mm -hmm. discussion and questions. And uh, we will definitely cut him off at the end of 90 minutes. So please bear that in mind. Okay, Thank thanks, you. thanks. Um, it's interesting that Pierce mentioned it because my memory also goes back these years. Uh, Pierce and Preve were here and they were the leaders. Every day uh, at after the conference, uh, you just waited for orders. Where we go tonight? And it was wonderful. You don't think, don't need to think about anything. You were told when to go swimming, when to go for food. It was all taken care of. Okay, look, uh, it's tutorial. So the talk will be of two parts. One part will be really for people who are not actively working on superconductivity. And so others know what to do with their laptops during this talk, this part. And then the second part, I will tell you something that is more modern and uh, hopefully it will be some exciting about what's going on. So, uh, it goes supposed to work, right? Yes. Uh, so let's very quick start with something very simple. Superconductivity is the resistance states of interacting electrons. The resistivity goes to zero at TC. It all started more than a century ago. And normally colloquium style talk will tell, tell you the story how it started and how by sleeping you can get a wonderful discovery. Uh, but the question is this. Let me start it in a very simple way. What we need for superconductivity? And uh, if we start with conventional Drew the theory, which predicts that the resistivity should remain finite at t equal to zero, the theory is based on Ohm's law. Ohm's law means that current is proportional to electric field, dissipative current, coefficient is proportional to lifetime of electrons. You immediately divide electric field by current and you get resistivity and everything is fine. Good. But I guess it's even before all the stories started with BCS, etc. It was pretty well known that if, if by any chance the system had a macroscopic condensate, so macroscopic number of particles in the same quantum mechanical state, this condensate has amplitude, this condensate has a phase, uh, and there is additional current associated with the gradient of this phase, and this current will be not accompanied by energy dissipation, and as such would exist at um, zero electric field. And of course, a non-zero current at zero electric field means that uh, resistivity is zero. Good. So uh, in this respect, in a simple language, really simple language, once we have macroscopic condensate, we have superconductivity. Good. Uh, for bosons, appearance of condensate is absolutely natural. This Bose-Einstein condensation uh, and uh, so on. But of course, fermions are fermions. And two formants can simply occupy it the same state. It's Pauli principle. Uh, however, trying to figure out which one is which. However, if two formants form the bound states, then bound states become boson, boson condense. And therefore, all this uh, standard logic means that we need to pair formants into bound state. Great. Uh, remember, my talk is about superconductivity out of repulsion. So in order to have bound state, you need attraction between fermions. So obviously, you cannot get bound state on repulsive interaction. You need attraction. So the question is how to get this attraction. And of course, BCS is a big click here because besides doing something on general trends, namely that bound state exists for uh, even for arbitrary weak attraction, there was a specific prediction for mechanisms the two electrons attract each other by exchanging something else. I just did quantum of lattice vibrations, which are phonons. There are zillions way to tell how it actually happens. One electron comes in, creates disturbance of the lattice, and other electrons come to the same area, read the disturbance of the lattice, and through disturbance of the lattice, the two electrons talk to each other, and this gives you effective attractive interaction. And uh, this has been definitely confirmed for many, many ordinary superconductors. I guess Macmillan Rowell is often cited as a work that really established that phonon mechanism is, uh, is the mechanism of superconductivity for conventional cases. 
But as we heard from Kole Prokofiev talk last week, uh, the problem is still ongoing and is not fully solved. And bipolaronic superconductivity is still active field of research here. Okay, uh, this is electron phonon case, and and it should work. Yes, and the new era goes back to one year or two years before Pierce and I met here for the first time. It's 1986 and Kuprex when the TC went up almost overnight. And uh, again, I will put several talks of this conference just in the context of what I'm going. Uh, these three talks are on subjects more generic than just simply Kuprex, but at least in the first, Leonid definitely mentioned Kuprex and I think Lara with uh, Lara Ben Fata will also mention Kuprex. So cooperates. Then next breakthrough in 2008, iron nictites, not the highest TC, but definitely highest amount of nature and science paper in the field of superconductivity. And then, of course, twisted bilayer graphene that was last week and will be this week pretty much subject of discussions at uh, this workshop. And besides this, number of other materials, heavy fermion materials, rutenates, titanates, nickelates, Kagame materials for which some topological superconductivity has been at least proposed and also observed in uh, one of the vanadium materials. Iridates, uh, including Kitaev materials, uranium tellurium too, which most likely shows time reversal symmetry breaking. So this is not a complete list. The question is this, is high TC really relevant for what is called new non-phononic superconductivity? The answer is definitely no. There is one slide which I borrowed some years ago from Gears Bloomberg. This is MGB2, wonderful superconductor, nice phonon superconductor, TC is 39 Kelvin. Let's not forget that the highest TC superconductors are um, hydrides under pressure and hydrogens um, still fit has TC larger than uh, 200 Kelvin. And the record, I guess, is really now close to room temperature, depending on in which room you are. Uh, uh, but then the question is, what really is relevant? And with this, I will say phrase that not, not everyone agrees with. That in cuprates, iron, nictites, rutenase, titanase, heavy fermion material, organic superconductors, I am willing to put um, I, to put twisted bilayer graphene there, but I know that this is not solved problem. Electron phonon interaction is not responsible for the pairing by one reason or another. In each case, you need to set the reason. Is it by symmetry? It doesn't give right symmetry of the order state or because it's weak. And I guess one good example here is really iron-based materials in which at the beginning of this iron-based era, people like Igor Masin and his collaborators calculate as the best case scenario for electron phonon superconductivity found one Kelvin. Since then, they move the temperature up, but it's still not 60 Kelvin. It's still order of magnitude, at least order of magnitude small. Let me take this as a premise that suppose that electron phonon interaction by one reason or another is not the mechanism for superconductivity. It doesn't mean that it's uh, not relevant to physics. It may relevant, be relevant to physics. Most likely waterfalls called waterfalls in the cuprates observed in uh, photoemission are due to phonons, but it's not a glue. Then obviously the question is simple. Uh, let me need to take this out, right? This needed somehow, oops. Can I eliminate it? More and uh, I don't want to leave the meeting. Hi, video pen, oops. Okay, I better do nothing. No, 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 there is another slide. Which one? Uh huh. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay, good. Uh, right. So if not phonons, then we have actually one choice electron electron interaction. And electron electron interaction is repulsive. So here is the story. Let's suppose that phonons are out and we consider electron electron interaction how get how it gets superconductivity out of repulsion. And this exactly uh uh, what I'm going to talk, and Sri will be talking about how to get pair density wave superconductivity with non zero finite momentum again, also out of repulsion. So the question is how one can get bound fermion pair out of repulsive interaction. 
story is old. Story started in early 60s of previous century, and it started with two works, one done by Anderson with Morel, another Landau with Lev Pitayevsky, who unfortunately passed away a couple of days ago. Uh, but the story, if I can, yes. The story has two parts, essentially. First, it's all about spherically symmetric system. That fermions can form bound pairs with any angular momentum, not necessarily with angular momentum zero, which we normally call S wave. So BCS is a story about S wave superconductivity when fermions bound in a state with zero angular momentum. The first statement from both groups who worked independently was that it's not necessary. It can be any angular momentum. Fine. But the second statement is much more important. That pairing problem decouples between different momentum components, which means that interaction can be completely repulsive in all channels except for one. And you still get pairing because there is just complete decomposition of different channels. Again, this is all for spherical symmetric case. Very good. There is one more here. Uh, if you look at what happens at large angular momentum, let's not ask what the numbers for TC you will get there, but just for simple reasoning, the larger the angular momentum, the larger the distances from which this components come from. And then another piece of information that at large angle, at large distances, Coulomb interactions occasionally gets over screen. There is free oscillation because of the sharpness of the Fermi surface. And because of Friedel oscillations, yes, interaction is repulsive. Most of them are repulsive, but there is some region where it's, uh, yes, I was told that if I keep it, yes. Uh, there are some regions where uh, the interaction gets overscreened. And the question is, can it be that this overscreening, that some component of angular momentum pick up interaction in this overscreened regions? And this brings, Con Lattinger story from 1965, uh, which by itself is quite interesting story because there are two papers, one by Con Lattinger and then detailed papers of the same by Lattinger only without Con, by reasons which I have no idea about. And they did something very serious and reason, uh, very serious. It was not just second order calculations. No, they did quite accurate, accurate analysis of non-analytic correction to regular interaction. And basically they said, yes, that the effect of Friedel oscillations, which remember is a power law compared to general screening of interactions that give you exponentially decaying angular momentum component, the expansion decaying with the number of M. What they found is the statement that if you go to large angular momentum, and particularly if you take odd angular momentum, 25, 27, 29, something like this, you definitely get attraction. Definitely means that interaction will be negative full square. Uh, there was a story about the temperature that they put in, which was 10 to minus 40, uh, but it was interesting story. It was just a really story about how important to be honest. Uh, at the time when they were doing their calculations, again, by the reasons which I don't, understand, don't fully understand and never get a definite answer. It was well believed that in helium-3 pairing should be D wave. So angular momentum equal to two. So despite having formulas for any value of L, both in short paper and in long paper, they only put the number for L equal to two. Get temperature 10 to minus 40. Everyone, sorry, 10 to minus 70. Yes, E to minus 40. Uh, everyone laughed and said, great. Best of luck of finding TC of 10 to minus 17. If they put... L equal to one into their formula, they get one millikelvin immediately. And this was before the discovery of superfluidity in helium-3. Why they didn't do it, I have no idea, but well, they didn't extend their formulas to where they didn't work, supposedly. Okay, anyway, uh, what is interesting is it was not done in short paper, it was also not done in long paper, yes. Was that when you assume the Prefactor is the Fermi energy? Yes, 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 yes. Another story is what is the prefactor. But if you assume the prefactor is just Fermi energy, you get 10 to minus 3 of Fermi energy. Fermi energy is Kelvin, so you get milligrams. Okay, but long story short, I guess this was really the first example of how one can potentially get superconductivity out of repulsive interaction. And the recipe here 
is that yes, it's repulsive, but you can always find at least one attractive component. The story was sort of forgotten. It developed, but it was forgotten. And then it resurfaced again, and you will see how it's related to what's now called spin fluctuation mechanism of the pairing, because it turns out it's all the same. Uh, yeah, OK. There is some somewhat shorter version, a simpler version of Con Lattinger, which was put by Faye and Lauser a couple of years later, already after the discovery of subfluidity in helium-3. Suppose that we have Hubbard interaction. Let's not play the game with screen Coulomb interaction. Suppose we start with Hubbard. Then the idea is this. You start with Hubbard, and uh, to first order, just Hubbard U, give you repulsion in S-wave channel, M equal to zero, and give you nothing in all other channels. So you act on top of zero. Then you go to second order, and the question is what you get on top of zero. You get attraction or repulsion. It turns out that in this case, you get attraction in all components with M not equal to zero, the largest is P wave. Uh, yes. So basic message here is that if you start with Hubbard, if you do calculations in three dimensions, later it turns out that if you do it in two dimensions, you get the same, but it work a little bit harder. Uh, then you find the final answer is that for attraction, you get S wave, for repulsion, you get P wave. This is all for isotropic k square over 2m dispersion. So it's not latest systems that we're interested. Nevertheless, it's good to know that you can get it. Good. So what I will do is the rest. I will look at the latest systems. And let me first start with some sort of negative statement. There is no theorem that superconductivity must be there. You well may have a latest system in which there will be no superconductivity, no matter what, down to t equal to zero. So there is no, because different channels do not factorize any longer. They're normally only finite number of uh, different one-dimensional or two-dimensional representation of the corresponding uh, group. For example, for square lattice D4H, you have four one-dimensional representations. So only four different components factorize other not. And so you're only searching whether it, in one of the four, you can get attraction. You may or may not have it. But you will see that a number of studies of in spirit of Con Lattinger give you at least right symmetry of the order parameter in the systems that people were talking about after 1986. Question? Yeah. Uh, in, in, a, in a crystal, a very low filling, doesn't it become effectively like a, a continuum system? Oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, there? absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. But you said there's no theorem. That but then, then the question is this. If you are, of course, if you are extremely low feeling, you get TC, which can be very small. Then you go into lattice system. You start putting in lattice effects. Mm -hmm. And you are not guaranteed that lattice effect will not kill, kill you what you get at very low feeling. So in other words, there's no guarantee that what you see at very low feeling will survive say close at quarter feeling or low to half feeling, something like this. Mm -hmm. And we know examples. In the square lattice model, if you start at very low feeling, you don't get dx square minus y square. Mm -hmm. You get actually either dxy or um, something else. Mm -hmm. And then that component disappears. Mm -hmm. And then dx square minus y square appears already at some finite feeling. So it's, uh, it's interplay. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, there is no. The question was, is there a rigorous statement that if you have repulsive U Hubbard model, then S-wave superconductivity is not possible? Uh, OK, good. Let me, it will be, if Pierce will allow me to go for two and a half hours, then it will be last slide in my talk about this. But uh, so far, let me quickly give his answer. If you want to combine strong Hubbard U with electron phonon interactions, the answer is there is a possibility to get S wave superconductivity. If it's only Hubbard U, I don't know. I think there's, you cannot get it. Yeah. OK, so what I will try to do, I will try to say, let's start, assume that we screen Coulomb interaction. And we do it on a lake. But even on a lattice, there is analogy of uh, free daily oscillation. So I don't want to go to large distances. I want to go to large angular momentum because there is no such thing as angular momentum on a lattice. I just want to see what you get out of this. And uh, 
this stuff is supposed to work. Yes. So coup rates. Nobody wants to talk about coup rates because it's a very complicated story. So let me go to either this region or the same region on the other side when coup rates are supposed to be nice metal with Lattinger type Fermi surface. And I will do some very simple. So really for the next 10 minutes, it will be a quick analysis for same analysis for several situations. So I want to take this Fermi surface and do something simple. Introduce dimensional scoupling. Let's assume that you start with Hubbard U. Dimensional scoupling is U times density of states without any elaborating more at the corner density of state is the larger simply by fermiology. So I want to introduce patches at the corner, call it one and two. Obviously when I change K to minus K, it's the same patch. So I want to play some very simple game. Instead of splitting interaction and angular momentum, blah, blah, blah. I just want to introduce two quantities. Interaction inside the corner, let's call it G1 and interaction between the corners or between patches, call it G2. Solve for the pairing, two by two problem. What I want to do, I want to see what is the pairing, what's the sign of the pairing coupling. By construction here, you need coupling negative to get attraction. Positive coupling means repulsion. So I have two channels, you have two couplings, solve two by two, meaning that you solve for superconductivity in this corner and that corner, meaning the two gaps, solve linearized equation for two gaps, those are two couplings that you get. G1 and G2 are both positive. So one coupling, no question is positive, absolutely. It's repulsion, it's S wave. But the other is, well, it's a difference between these two guys. And again, if you do Hubbard U, then to first order, you get nothing. You get in the second channel, you get zero. Then you again play uh, on top of zero. Great, let's play it on top of zero. Let's do calculation to order U square. I just put one diagram because everything else cancel out. Also, we need to check this. And there's the answer that came out, I think already pretty much in Fain Lauser paper, if you read carefully what they did. Uh, that interaction at large momentum transfer becomes even more repulsive than interaction at small momentum transfer. We'll try to find out physical explanation for this in, in 10 minutes. But right now it's just a logical statement. You do calculations, you find that yes, repulsive interaction becomes even more repulsive. But the one at finite momentum becomes more repulsive than the one at small momentum. But look here, this guy becomes more repulsive than this one. So lambda b becomes negative. Negative means attraction. So for more repulsion, you get actually attractive interaction in some particular channel. What is this channel? Quite obvious. You solve for eigenfunctions, you find that the gap changes sign between one and two. So it's sign changing gap between patches combined with the fact that K and minus K are the same point. Obviously you have four points where the gap must go through zero on the Fermi surface. This is D wave. And again, without discussing coup rates very much, this is the work for which Buckley Price was given. ARPES studies of superconducting gap, which clearly shows, doesn't show as ARPES that the gap changes sign, but it shows quite clearly that the gap goes to zero along the diagonal. Very good. So, iron based. Very quickly, the same story pretty much. It's a zoo, sorry, first of all, phase diagram, same players. Magnetism at zero doping, superconductivity at finite doping. Dope either whole by whole by electron. There is also isovalent doping. There is a variant of the system which is superconducting already at uh, without doping. So variety is there. Look at the fermiology, it's a zoo. Many different, well, many mean five different orbitals. And of course, it's a zoo of states. But as everyone who worked in this business knows that if you zoom into what happens near the Fermi surface, you get nice hole pockets. You get nice electron pockets, hole pockets are in the center, electron pockets are in the corner. So you can play a simple, oversimplified, of course, game when you just put hole pockets, hole Fermi surfaces in the center and electrons in the corner. And then you get the same stories in cuprates. Only instead of patches, I now have Fermi surfaces. So I get the same story. I can write down interaction within pocket and interaction between pockets. Same story again as it was before. Patch, the word patch is replaced by pockets. So it's really same story. One coupling is definitely positive. Another well depends on which interaction is larger. You do the same con analysis. 
And again, you find out that the second order in U, you get more repulsion between pockets than within pocket. And because of more repulsion, one of the coupling becomes negative. And you get, again, sign changing solution, which will be simply what's called S plus minus. Why it's S? Because you make a circle around each pocket, nothing happens with the gap. So it's S. But it's not conventional S. It's S that changes sign because when momentum goes, changes by pi. So it's S plus minus of sign changing S or whatever. Question? Yes. Aren't you promulgating an urban legend here? The urban legend of S plus minus. If you take many of these systems, you have some without pockets of holes, some without pockets of electrons. And in your own papers, you note that the ratio of two delta over TC seems to be the same for all of them, which wouldn't be the case if you use a different mechanism for each particular configuration of electron and hole pocket. So is this not a very, it's a very nice story, but it's very unlikely. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, um, I would not say that because as you know, in every election, there is a majority that decides and there, there are extremes on both sides. The examples that you showed are extremes. Yes, you can go to the extreme when there are no electron pockets. You can go into extreme when there are no hole pockets. But in this extremes, nobody actually measured to delta over TC to the same way as uh, it's measured for conventional materials. So in the extreme, I'll be a little bit more serious with dancing. In the extremes, it's entirely possible that, for example, in one extreme, as Louis Telfer keeps existing, you can get D wave instead of S wave. And we know the reason. But if you go into systems which have both electrons and hole pockets, then let me do show you two pieces of evidence that it's S plus minus. And again, we can discuss evidence, but let me let me show it. Again, I'm talking about systems with hole and electron pockets. There are extremes, very high electron doping or very high hole doping, where it's only hole and electrons. But in this extremes, TC is one Kelvin. I don't know company about the materials with 60 Kelvin. Those cases are on the plot in your paper also, and they have the same high value of around seven of two delta over TC. We can look at it later, but it's a paper with your, your co-author and it has pure hole pockets and pure electron He's going pockets. To melt me down. Uh, okay, Pierce, uh, I, I know how to defend. Uh, in, uh, let me put in one phrase. In a situation when you have, say, only electron pockets, there is no laser artist in this situation. You cannot reach electron pockets with laser artist. So I don't think that you can really accurately say what is to delta over TC. But so those cases shouldn't have been plotted in your paper? Let me check carefully what is in okay. the paper. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let me check. All right. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay. So now piece of evidence. One is simple. How to prove that the system is S wave, not D wave? Well, do ARPES and look at the Fermi surface. This is the original ARPES from Iowa group. This is Kaminsky group. This is laser ARPES from uh, Shikshin, who unfortunately also passed away recently. Uh, and uh, clearly it shows, this is really very accurate um, ARPES data, which includes also small, another for a surface that I didn't talk about. Uh, and it shows that the gap doesn't change as you make a circle around the Fermi surface. This is S-wave. I cannot imagine that this is not S-wave from this data. But this is not to say much. S-wave can be anything. It can be, can be due to phonon. How to prove that it's sign changing S-wave. This is a more sophisticated analysis. And there were several evidences. Let me show you one. It's the same story as with cuprates. In 1965, 1995, everyone was talking about this wonderful resonance peak in cuprates uh, that uh, pumps out at four on MEV in YBCO. And the same happens here. I mean, that if the gap changes sign between at some momentum difference, and you ask what superconductivity does to spin response at this momentum, because of sign changes, there is a game of uh, coherence factors, and you get a resonance peak below two delta. This is what theory says. Uh, Dax Klapina and Tom Meyer did calculations. Ilya Yeremin with Korshinov did calculations. And this experiment from um, um, 
IFW group in Germany. And you clearly see that this all is the momentum connecting center of pole and electron pocket. It's exactly right momentum. You judge by yourself, but to me, there's clearly a sharp peak emerges below superconducting temperature as you expect for sign changing gap. There are evidence from STM, um, but uh, let's not talk about it. Question on the web. Yes. I, I missed. Um, can we also consider from Farnud Kamsari? And Farnud says, can we also consider that the RKKY interaction may induce some bound state of electrons? In principle, yes. In principle, yes. Yeah. Yes. In principle, yes. And in fact, I can elaborate a little bit more on this. There was a Ruchman Lee recent paper, so essentially the same. But again, it will not be ordinary S wave. Okay, let me give you the third example before I move to the second part of the talk and just do something. It's a little bit more sophisticated. I put possibly twisted by layer graphene, although of course the judgment is there. It's a story about, uh, in this case, just simple graphene, which has Dirac points and K and K prime. And suppose we managed to dope graphene up to a point where chemical potential goes into one half point and one half point is when for the surfaces that start at small triangles around k and k prime at some point merge and end up with one large Fermi surface. In fact, there was there were experiments at Clarpe's experiments when you put uh, calcium um, and potassium on top of top and below um, singular graphene and claim was that yes, you can actually even reach this. But a uh, simple argument is this. This is why I present, want to present this. It's the same story about large density of states in some patches of the Fermi surface. Looks the same story as before, but with one interesting twist. Because of symmetry, there are three points, three non-equivalent points uh, where you have one hope singularities and density of states. Other three are related by K to minus K symmetry. And number of interactions is two because of the symmetry. So you still have the same point. They have one interaction inside the patch, another interaction between the patches, but interaction between patch one and three is the same as between one and two and between two and three by symmetry. So we have three by three problem because three different corners, two interactions, what you get? You get immediately when you solve this equation, you get, of course, one channel is S wave, no question about this. It's repulsive and will stay repulsive forever. But there are two other degenerate channels for which interaction is the difference between these two couplings. Story is the same as before. We start with zero. If we start with Hubbard interaction, we need to go to second order to see what happens. And predictably what happens is that this guy becomes negative. So, uh, right, it was the original one. I said this one, yeah. And you, you gain, you get more repulsion at large momentum transfer than at small momentum transfer. Same story, but there is a twist. The two are degenerate and degenerate by symmetry. As a result, if you look what happens, you will get two different orders which develop simultaneously. In D-wave formulation, both have four nodes. In D-wave formulation, one is analog of DX square minus Y square, another it's DXY. They're degenerate by symmetry. And then you ask when they develop. You need to write down, of course, Ginsburg-Landau for this and derive all coefficients in Ginsburg-Landau, but then you ask, okay, wonderful. When they both appear, what happens? Well, they do appear with the factor of I or minus I. So you immediately get chiral superconductor, chiral because it's combination of dx square minus y square and dxy, and the superconductor breaks time reversal symmetry. And you get it instantly, just because you have two degenerate channels. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's a it's question that goes a little bit further than what I'm talking about. So I in the it's not me when people like uh, Gonzalez and others 
extended this to twisted bilayer graphene. I think they were talking about Hubbard and Marie. Uh, then in graphene, you know, there are two valleys. And if you have K from one valley, minus K is always from the other valley. But I don't think that this matters much for this kind of mechanism. So I think you still get, and you know, you, you have one whole points in graphene. So you can, then the question is, do you have six or 12 one whole points? There are two possibilities and two, two different scenarios depending on how transformation is from Dirac points to one hopes. And then on top of this, of course, strong coupling effect that may tell you that the dispersion may be completely different, but even dispersion that has minimum a different uh, gamma point, it still has one hopes. So one hopes are there. So short answer is that it is Hubbard in Marais uh, and it's maybe oversimplification. You don't need to, to do it. Uh, and two values must be included, but two values will not change the story here. Yeah. Okay, good. Now, now the second part of the talk, that this is great, but it's too good to be true. Because in everything I did, I said, let's take Hubbard interaction. Let's assume that Hubbard interaction does give you nothing in channels which are non s wave. So you have a wonderful playground, you start with zero. And then on top of zero, second order can give you either positive or negative. If it gives you something negative, then you immediately get attraction. Great. But in reality, of course, we never deal with Hubbard interaction. We always deal with screen Coulomb interaction. So it's completely natural to expect that if you, that your starting point, this interaction with small momentum transfer, this interaction with large momentum transfer. And you don't, it's not it's, uh, rocket science. They will say that this guy should be larger. They always get larger initial interaction at small momentum transfer. So which means that you start with repulsion. And once you start with repulsion, then immediately it's a question about perturbation theory, which is in this respect, conlatiture mechanism is. If we want to talk not about is an isotropic system with infinitely large angular momentum, if we want to take real lattice system, you start with repulsive interaction. You go to second order, and second order somehow has to overcome the repulsion, which you cannot do if it's weak coupling. So somehow you need to go to stronger coupling and abandon the idea of weak coupling theory. Uh, and to a certain extent, this is a picture for those who remember what happened in the world in 1963, right? Uh, and um, let me try to briefly describe three approaches. One will be uh, goes under normalization group analysis. And uh, I think it's a nice approach. It's still weak coupling, but it tells you that in some situation, you can go beyond second order. And in fact, sum up infinite series of graphs for the randomization for cone Lattinger effect. It's basically cone Lattinger taken to infinite order. Second one is also cone Lattinger taken to infinite order in a different way. This is what is goes under the umbrella of uh, electron boson theories. This is what happens when you consider interaction near some density wave instability, whether it's spin charge density wave, circulated currents, pneumatics, something like this. It's different line of arguments here. And the third one, again, if I have time, it will be very quick about what happens. Can you get S wave out of repulsion? The answer is you can get S wave out of repulsion, but it will be a situation when you will get a gap which changes sign as a function of frequency, and it all goes into superconductivity with embedded dynamical vortices in. So let me tell about RG approach very quickly. Uh, it works well for best for iron based materials let me quickly repeat same story you get uh one interaction which i used different notations here so the notations will be back i just didn't uh change it so let me quickly get it here so the question was this g1 g3 g4 is what i previously called g1 g2 and they will be called g1 g2 in all other slides so the story was like this can we go beyond second one and still get still keep coupling small? The answer is yes, we can. There is BCS theory of superconductivity for this. I mean, that if there is some, some logarithmical contribution from, from the renormalization, then we can go in order of coupling, then coupling square times log, coupling cube times log square, et cetera. 
and at the same time neglect simply coupling square, coupling cube, etc. Standard argument for BCS superconductivity. Normally, collateral normalizations are just normalization in powers of the coupling, so we cannot do it. But if they are, by some reasons, also logarithmical, then we can try to sum them on all orders. And this is what goes into what is called parquet normalization group approach. When you look at iron-based materials, and you find out that you do renormalization in a particle whole channel. So what's collateral in some sense? You take interaction of particle particle channel and say, no, it cannot be just simply pairing interaction U. You need fully um, irreducible interaction. So you need to collect all the normalization from other channels. This is what Conlatinger does at second order. You take normalization from particle whole channel, and here they are also logarithmical. Why? Because one is whole pocket, one an electron pocket, and it's a story which goes into excitonic insulator. Story that if you have hole and electron pockets, the particle hole bubble behaves in the same way as particle particle bubble. So, details aside, if you have logarithms in the particle hole channel and have logarithms in the particle particle channel, then treat both equally. Don't tell that one renormalization is important, one, one renormalization of the particle hole channel only has to be taken to renormalize interaction in the particle particle channel. Take interaction in the particle particle channel and normalize interaction in the particle hole channel. So it's all mutual, and you get two interactions now back to normal notations, which I uh, keep here. G1, G2 are interaction in the particle particle channel. There is also G3 and G4, two different interaction in the particle hole channel. Uh, great. So put all of them together. You get a set of remuneration group equations because all of them are logarithmical. And this means that I just sum infinite series of diagrams. And instead of summing this infinite series of diagrams, I know I can write down differential equations. What's the result? The result is interesting. I'm interested in these two guys, G1 and G2. This is a bad guy. This against pairing. This is a good guy. This is for pairing. I want to make good guy more repulsive than the bad guy. This is what this equation does. I'm not making this. It just follow up from this equation. That you start with repulsion. You keep going, and now you can do this because couplings are small, but couplings times logarithms are of order of one. And you see that good guy goes up, bad guy goes down. You get a scale. It's interesting. System by itself develops a scale below which it has attraction. So it develops, if you like, upper cutoff for any attractive interaction. And there is a reason why this, this happens. Because there is an interaction, which is in the particle hole channel, which wants the system to become antiferromagnetic. And then the process of becoming antiferromagnetic it wants to enhance all interactions at large momentum transfer, including component of the pairing interaction. And once this guy grows up, it pushes up good component of the pairing interaction because this is the one with large momentum transfer, while the one with small momentum transfer here goes down while it's not necessary. Which means that what's the story? This is intelligent way to say that spin fluctuations promote superconductivity. That uh, just let me finish the present. So basically, you get interaction which is favoring something else, in this case, favoring antiferromagnetism, and it pushes up good component of the pairing interaction. How these two compete, it's a different story. Sometimes red line is pairing interaction. You see, it changes sign. Positive here means attraction. And sometimes it just loses to tendency to magnetism. Sometimes it eventually wins over tendency of magnetism and becomes a leading instability. These are details. But basic message is here that I want to go to the message here, right? So spin fluctuations uh, enhance the tendency. Interactions that favor spin fluctuations enhance the tendency superconductivity. Superconducting fluctuation at large momentum transfer enhances the tendency towards magnetism, which actually goes like this, that as long as both are not ordered, they support each other. Once one is ordered, then it will try immediately to kick out everything else and to fight against any other order, which in good physical terms means that competition is good, but monopoly is bad. As long as the two compete, great. They promote each other. As long as one is ordered, they try to kick out everything else. 
No, sorry, there was a question. Does it depend on the thing all the electrons go to having the same time scale? No, no, no. It only no, sorry. The question was whether this RG equation depend on whether hole and Fermi surface has the same diameter. No, the ratio of masses goes into overall factor in the coupling, and they just incorporate it into the coupling. So you can have one ten times larger than the other as long as both are circular. The same equation, just renormalize. Yeah, Remy. This would be same story. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The question was about pneumaticity, how the pneumaticity plays here. It will be the same story, but uh, you need to extend it a little bit. What you need is uh, two different orbitals, dxz and dyz. Then you write down different couplings and you get the same story that repulsive interaction between hole and electron pockets will favor pneumatic order, pneumatic order, this Q equal to zero order. However, that order changes sign between hole and electron pockets, like S plus minus superconductivity. It's the, it's the only pneumatic order that develops due to repulsive interaction. And for this, we have this wonderful experiment from Japan that shows that, yes, pneumatic order has opposite sign on hole and electron pockets. So this is well established. And then, of course, again, the same interaction that favors plus minus in pneumatic channel also favors plus minus in the superconducting channel. So the game is exactly the same. Okay, great. So my addition is good, monopoly is bad. We are great here. I want to say a few words about, yeah. Um, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, I already went ahead of myself. Yeah, I will go to the next slide and we'll answer this question. Yeah. Oh, the question was, I use the word spin fluctuation, which I shouldn't because I didn't explain why I'm using this word. That was essentially the question, right? Yeah, I know that what this interaction does at the end of the day, I just need to explain why uh, I say that spin fluctuation promote super, uh, superconductivity. Uh huh. It yeah, it very much depends uh, what the window you have. Suppose you have a large window for RG. You can start with weak coupling, so G all Gs are much smaller than one. You go to the regime with G times log is of order of one. But if RG develops already substantially up to the scale, then log is large. Log is large means that G is still small. So then I can neglect all higher powers of G, etc. If I don't have this window, then you know what the answer will be. Then everything depends on numbers. This all assuming somehow that there is a window for RG. Okay, let's do the last part. Fermion bosom models. Here I need to answer the question from three because I want to give you one example. It doesn't have to be one, but this one example is spin fluctuation scenario. What it means. We said, and I said so, that interaction at large momentum transfer enhances, becomes more repulsive. This is how I get attraction. Great, this is job. But I want to go a little bit further, take this guy, and ask this, I have pairing interaction, dress pairing interaction, renormalized by con Lattinger. As usual, for superconductivity, we need anti-symmetrized interaction. We need vertex. This is how we split our interaction into spin singlet and spin triplet channel. So I can take this guy and ask which component of the renormalized interaction becomes attractive. Is it in spin channel or in chart channel? This I can do because I can take this interaction again and I need to deal with anti-symmetrized interaction for pairing and anti-symmetrized interaction has both spin and charge component. And the answer is spin. So already at this level, at the level of con latinger, we can say that yes, it's spin component of the interaction that enhances. 
and basically spin enhancement of the effective interaction in spin channel promotes you attraction in this particular case G wave channel. So knowing this, I can say, okay, let me now forget about RG. RG was a good way to justify calculations. Now I close my eyes. I don't know how to justify anything. I just take ladder series in spin channel, sum up this ladder series, some use the word RPA with this, which is forbidden word in some circle. Uh, and uh, then you obtain effective interaction mediated by pi pi spin flotation. Pretty much the same that you get in RG. But here you do it without saying the word I want to stay with weak coupling. I really want to bring the system close to, in this particular case, pi pi anti-ferromagnetic instability. And I want to see what happens with superconductivity. And then sometimes the answer is immediate and what you want. You took component of interaction, which is good for superconductivity, and enhance it artificially by saying that the system comes out close to transition into state, which is a state with the same large momentum transfer. In this respect, everything is good. We start, we cheat it a little bit, but we definitely get attraction. No question. It's just by construction. Interaction is attractive in the D-wave channel. But there is a caveat. If we want to do this and bring the system close to the critical point, meaning to the order in a particle hole channel. Yes, you substantially enhance attractive pairing interaction, but there is a competitor. The same interaction that mediates pairing, also if you view it in a particle hole channel, this is the interaction which destroys Fermi liquid. And now you have a different story. Attraction is guaranteed to you, but you have a competitor. The, in RG, there was no competitor because we assume that the coupling is weak, and we didn't include any self-energy effect. Here we must include them. And this is what was presented last week in a number of talks. This is what will be presented this week. It's a story about strange metals. And strange metals to me means essentially non-fermi liquid and large self-energy. And again, attraction is guaranteed, but you have a competitor. And the question is, competitor wants something different. Competitor doesn't want superconductivity. Competitor wants non-fermi liquid. So the question is who wins? Tendency towards pairing or tendency towards non-fermi liquid? They come from the same interaction. This is just nice slide to show this. This is just to say that they are competing. Why? Because if you make fermions incoherent, you destroy Cooper logarithm. If you make system fermions ordered and superconducting, you eliminate scattering at small frequencies and therefore the electrons recover nice Fermi liquid behavior. So superconductivity works against or acts against non-Fermi liquid, non-Fermi liquid acts against superconductivity. If you look what happens, then uh, this all goes into the story about how to treat pairing at a quantum critical point in the metal. And long story short, yes, sure. Uh, it's a the, question. the question was that in the particular spin fluctuation case, this is hot spot story, which the first approximation is true. You can do equally the same story near a pneumatic transition then it will be full Fermi surface. But in both cases, there is a competition between non-Fermi liquid and, uh, and tendency towards pairing. Right, but it's much less important to have hot spots. And you have much weaker uh, superconducting tendency, right? So in some sense, hotspot determined what happens. Or if you don't want this, go to a situation of stronger coupling when the whole Fermi surface becomes hot. Okay, I just want to show you one specific feature here that uh, when you deal with this quantum critical models, dynamics plays essential role. Because first of all, destruction of Fermi liquid comes from frequency dependence on the self energy. And at the same time, effective boson fluctuations of the order parameter becomes massless at the critical point. And if you look at the end of the day, what you need, you need uh, effective interaction averaged over the Fermi surface which turns out to be singular function of frequency of some exponent. And 
three asked the question about this exponent. Let me not go into details of all the stories with different proper problems and a lot of people working on them with different exponents. I want just to show you one thing here that what is the competition between non Fermi liquid and superconductivity in terms of equation? It's basically said like two equations like this one for the pairing vertex, when pairing vertex is non zero system is superconducting. Another is for fermionic self energy. When this guy gives you non Fermi liquid, then you get non Fermi liquid. And very long short story, long story short, you look at the equation for phi, sigma is in denominator. The larger in sigma, the less tendency towards pairing. Look at equation for sigma phi is in denominator. So the larger is phi, the smaller is self energy. It's competition on a trivial level. They compete because they opposite terms stand in denominator. So when you look at this, by the way, superconducting gap, the one we like to associate with superconductivity, essentially the ratio of phi and sigma. And if you go to BCS case, which in this case means exponent equal to zero and pairing interaction is just a constant at low frequencies, you get nice features that nothing depends on frequency, self energy is zero, and you get a nice BCS. But if you want to go to any value of the coupling here, you immediately get non Fermi liquid self energy. And non Fermi liquid self energy means that your pairing emerges out of non Fermi liquid, if it emerges. Very good. You ask computer, first of all, to see whether pairing emerges. Who wins? Yes. Well, wait a second, wait a second. Pairing vertex is obtained using fully dressed green functions. Uh, there were talks about SYK. So this is the version, uh, same version as SYK in some sense. Uh, what it means? It means that uh, you deal with absence of quasi particles, but still presence of the Fermi surface. So Fermi surface is sharp. Self energy is large, but it's only a function of frequency. At zero frequency, self energy is zero, and I have a locus of point where G minus one is zero at zero frequency. So Fermi surface is sharp. There is no quasi particle. What it means is there is no quasi particle. It means that uh, this guy in denominator is larger than omega. So you start destroying what we normally call Cooper logarithm. Yes, it's there. So all, no, all strange metal feature, all absence of quasi particles is built into this formula. It's built here, it's, it's built in SYK type models, which gives the same equations at the end of the day. I hope I give, I'm not sure that I answer this question, but at least the answer is this. All non quasi particle features are here. But it's a situation without quasi particles, but with sharp Fermi surface, which I think pretty much everyone has. Okay, uh, let me quickly move to the last few slides that I want to show. So, first of all, we want to check who wins non Fermi liquid or superconductivity. For this, we ask a good friend called computer. And the good friend just calculates what is superconducting TC. If it's zero, then non Fermi liquid wins. It turns out, no, it's not zero. For any value of the coupling gamma, TC is finite. Don't look that it goes to infinity when gamma goes to zero simply because it's unconstrained BCS. But it's important that for any value of the exponents, it's the same. It's, it's finite. Means superconductivity wins in the competition with non Fermi liquid. Great. You may say the end of the story. Superconductivity wins. Forget about non-Fermi liquid. This is what you get. 
And moreover, you calculate solve nonlinear gap equation. This your gap function, I really plotted delta, not phi here. And it behaves completely normally in the sense that it's finite at zero frequency, as you expect in BCS. And then, you know, in BCS, it's a constant up to some scale, and then you put it to zero. And here it's just short, soft cutoff instead of sharp cutoff. The gap just goes down and disappears at large frequency. Yes, Remy. Um, in this case, the question was, uh, in what parameter range superconductivity wins? Notice that there is only one parameter here, exponent gamma. That's the only parameter. Everything else is universal. I will show you one slide when I artificially add extra parameter. But so far, we don't have any freedom. It's, a, it's surprising that just like an SYK, well, in SYK, there is a ratio of um, number of fermions and number of bosons, which you can use as a parameter. Here, there is no even no such ratio. So in this respect, it's completely universal problem. And if something wins, it wins. If something loses, it loses. There is no parameter you can vary except for this exponent. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes, I'm coming to this. I'm coming to this. Yeah. Sorry? No, it comes out from here. Question. The question was, do I need another scale for sigma? No, this is equation for sigma. Put phi is equal to zero. You get a standard equation for sigma, which give you non-fermi liquid cell. Let me. You need something? Oh, yes, you need to, there will be omega naught here, right? Some scale. This G. So if you, you I measure everything in units of G, then everything becomes universal. So yeah, G times number determines me. Yes, yes, yes. So in this, if, if I measure everything in units of G, coefficient here is just a number, universal number. Okay, uh, Pierce, do I have zero, right? Oh, really? Great, then I can talk for 10 minutes. Yes, yeah, sure. I actually... Okay, guys, I don't really want to keep your lunches. I know lunch is an agenda. I will be done pretty soon. I just want to make one point here. So I hope I can meet these are equations. And again, keep repeating that there is another model very similar called SYK. At the end of the day, the equation for SYK is pretty much the same as this equation and conclusions are the same. Okay. Uh, this I already said. This I already said. Great. Everything looks great. And now in the last 10 minutes or five minutes, I want to say that something is interesting here. We face here fundamentally non-BCS space. And I will tell you what is fundamental here. Uh, fundamental means this. Uh, let's depart for the normal state. Let's try to calculate pairing susceptibility and see what we get from pairing susceptibility. If we do it in BCS, we know how to do it. Everything is frequency independent, so you need to put temperature, otherwise you get singularities. So what you do, you write gap equations, fine delta is the same here. You put extra, and then you calculate susceptibility as a reaction to what you put. So phi divided by phi naught is susceptibility. We know how to solve this equation. It's standard Cooper logarithms. We sum up series of Cooper logarithms. And we get wonderful denominator. I'm telling you just BCS theory of superconductivity. You get wonderful denominator, divide phi by phi naught. We know what happens. There is a critical temperature exponentially small. When you go below this temperature and go, for example, to zero temperature, your pairing susceptibility is way negative. And when you calculate, when you obtain negative susceptibility, you know what it means. It means instability. It means basically that the pole in this susceptibility is in the upper half plane rather frequent, uh, rather than in the lower half plane. Very good. Let's do it in our case. Same, absolutely the same, but we depart from non-fermi liquid normal state. And we want to look what kind of pairing susceptibility we get. Look at the equation. We get two components here. 
this guy is nothing but fermionic self energy at small frequencies it's larger than omega because we have non fermi liquid sigma is parametrically larger than omega another component is interaction which is singular and if you combine these two powers you find that scaling dimension in the kernel is one like in bcs so you do get logarithms in the perturbation theory means that if I start putting phi naught instead of phi and start doing integration, um, I will get logarithms. Like in BCS, I, this all works at frequencies again smaller than G, which I put at the upper cutoff. I can do it a little bit accurately, but it doesn't matter. So let's do it. There is one difference. There is no weak coupling limit. The coupling is a constant because every, again, everything is expressed in terms of G, and the rest is numbers, and numbers are numbers. So I sum up logarithms, and I find that, yeah, same, but there is a factor of one half, one six, etc., in front of higher powers here. And you sum these logarithms, you get power law, not one divided by one minus log, which means simple thing. You sum up logarithms, you get nothing. This is not a Cooper pairing problem. If you sum up logarithms, you get pairing susceptibility phi divided by phi naught, which remains positive even at zero temperature at all frequencies. We don't see any trace of instability. But you know, computer tells you there is a finite DC. There is an instability. So where it comes from? Well, plus this guy again. This guy tells you, well, that let's look at this equation at small frequencies. Kernel is marginal, means dimension one. Which means, simple thing, that we need to search for the solution in the power law. Logarithm is extreme of this power law, but let's search for the solution of this equation in the power law without phi naught, then we add phi naught. And what we find is that we search for a solution in the power because kernel has dimension of one, same power goes on the other side of the equation. All we need to do is to match the two sides and obtain this exponent alpha. And you get it. If you do it like summation of logarithms, you get real, real alpha. I already showed you. You get solution in the form of the real power. But now substitute and see what you get. Substitute, here is what you get. You get complex exponents. Instead of real exponents, you get complex exponents. It's uh, by itself, it's interesting. There is nothing complex here in this equation. It has completely real coefficients. Yet solution gives you two complex conjugated exponents. And what it means, it means that at small frequencies, this function is the sum of two complex power, and complex power is cosine of logarithm. So it's oscillating solution. This was done by Shri and others in condensed matter, uh, and us included. Yeah. Uh, and this was done by other group who was working in high energy part and doing holographic superconductivity. And Jörg Schmarin gave a talk at the same time last week and was talking about equivalence between two approaches. What it means from our perspective that there are oscillations. It means that perturbation theory starting from a constant will never match what I get at low frequencies. <laughs> because again, I have a question with positive coefficients. When I do perturbation theory, I can only increase the value of uh, phi. I start with a constant at something positive. Next time I gain something positive. So from this perspective, it's only increases. From other perspective, the function has zeros. You cannot match these two functions, which means that you need to integrate break a symmetry. You need to introduce order parameter in order to break low frequency behavior and, and find the match. And this is exactly what happens. When you see this, there's indication that something that the system is unstable. You introduce non-zero phi, non-zero order parameter, which means superconductivity, you will be able to solve non-linear equation. But to me, this means that this is really fundamentally non-BCS pairing, not because of attraction versus repulsion in this case, but because of competition. So there are another phenomena that competes and forces completely different uh, reasoning for the pay. So this is part number two, that everything goes well. Superconductivity wins competition in the Fermi liquid, but Fermi liquid strikes in the sense that 
it's really not BCS pairing. And I keep repeating this. This, this is a phenomena called holographic superconductivity, which uses holographic dual between gauge and gravity. And York gave a talk, so who didn't listen to his talk, it's all recorded, essentially about analogy between what we are doing and what uh, people doing holographic superconductivity and gravity do. It's the same equation. So at the end of the day, it's the same theory. Okay, uh, Premi asked about extra parameter. I don't have one, but I have hands. So I can introduce extra parameter by hand, like an SYK model, this extra parameter is introduced by varying number of fermions and number of bosons, both go to infinity, but their, their, number, their ratio is a number. So what I can do here? I can uh, say uh, that suppose by hand, we uh, make interaction in the particle particle channel smaller. Uh, Shri will say, no, I don't do it by hand. We do it by going from original SU2 to matrix SUN, which would be absolutely right. This is why I put a factor of N, so we can do it accurately. But the net result is this, what I want to do. I want to make tendency towards non-fermi liquid stronger. I want to take interaction in a particle particle channel weaker and ask a question, does it mean that we have a threshold? Because obviously when I do be go between real and imaginary exponents, it looks like a threshold problem. And yes, it is a threshold problem. You can solve this and we did it for, S for this model and with Laura class and we did the same for SYK model. It's the same story. Yes, making parameter N larger for fixed gamma, you go from a state with complex exponent to the state with real exponent. And this is naked non-fermi liquid ground state. So the answer is that if you allow me to add parameter, I can get situation when non-fermi liquid wins over superconductivity, it will be here. And I can have a situation when superconductivity wins over non-fermi liquid, it will be here. But I can only do this because it's completely different panic mechanism, which is threshold. Here, in this region, I have a real exponents, which means pairing susceptibility is always positive and not oscillating. Here I have complex exponents. It means that I cannot match low and high frequency behavior. I need to break symmetry and introduce order parameter to match. Them. And it's a lot of interesting math, including some of which matches with Denson talk here last week. This is tip of the iceberg. Uh, because the actual phase diagram contains two different superconducting phases and transition between them. Uh, but if you give me two extra hours or three extra hours, I will tell about this. Uh, in the last five or even less than five minutes, I want to talk about the very last part. This is related to the question that Kole asked at the beginning of my talk. Can it be, can we, I always talking about non-S wave, whether it's RG, whether it's electron boson problem, it was always studied that yes, conventional S wave is always repulsive. You want to do something extra, whether it's S plus minus, D plus, D one plus I, D two, or simple D wave, something non S wave. Question is, can we get S wave from repulsive interaction? And at first glance, the answer is no, we cannot. But at the same time, at the same time, all textbooks will tell us that yes, of course, take electron phonon interaction and you get S wave superconductivity. But the same textbooks uh, are saying that there is also Coulomb interaction. And one of the author of textbook is sitting on the first row, and he put it absolutely right in his book. Uh, so the question is BCS story is attraction due to phonons. But on top of this, we have animal of the room. We have elephant in the room, sorry. And this is electron electron Coulomb repulsion, which is stronger than electron phonon interaction. And there is a myth which translated into literature that, yes, uh, you renormalize Coulomb interaction over some window frequencies, get smaller, and at some point it gets smaller than electron phonon interaction, you get an attraction, this is a myth. Uh, there is no such thing as attraction. And total interaction is always repulsive, no matter what. Uh, because you start with Coulomb interaction, you start screening it, and phonons uh, effectively change dielectric constant, bake it frequency dependent, but you will never change uh, attraction, repulsion into attraction. So total interaction is repulsive. And there is a question how to get S-wave superconductivity out of repulsive interaction. 
Then it's a story that really goes back to Gurevich, Larkin, Fierce's story to Tanaka. And uh, again, it's uh, correctly done in uh, Pierce Coleman book. And the uh, story goes like this. In a certain approximation, certain approximation, you can just say, well, what happens due to electron phone interaction? You take repulsive interaction, and it becomes still repulsive, but smaller and smaller frequency. This is what I wanted to show here. This interaction is repulsive. It's positive. But as a function of frequency, it's smaller at smaller frequency than at larger frequency. It's still completely, completely repulsive interaction. You want to solve for superconductivity for this repulsive interaction. And the answer, again, known and then forgotten and then uh, recovered again, is that you can get a solution. But this solution will be in some sense similar to what I told you before. Only instead of momentum, it will be frequency. It will be solution in which the gap at small frequencies and the gap at large frequencies have opposite sign. So what basically you do by looking at this interaction, you want to take a gap which on average will cancel a constant. And then on top of the constant, there will be deep at small frequencies, and this is what is electron phonon attraction. So you need the gap that on average will go to zero when you integrate over all frequencies. And by doing this, it cancels the large constant, if it can. So anyway, this is a solution. You get plus minus, same that we talk about with respect to S plus minus or D, but now as a function of frequency. And I want to finish with the word, there's an element of topology here, because part of our workshop is in topology. Topology here is in a trivial way, but still it's interesting. That the gap function that changes sign on Matsubara frequency is a topological gap function, in a sense that each zero is a center of dynamical vortex. You just take imaginary frequency, real frequency. Matsubara axis is here. You get zero here, and you also get, of course, another zero here. Just make a circle around this point. You will find that the phase of the gap will change by 2 pi when you go along the circle. So there is a dynamical vortex sitting here. It has consequence of what happens on the real axis, but it is there. And so in this respect, the vortex, this is vortex, this also vortex. They cannot just appear. They can either come from infinity or appear due to annihilation, due to unbinding of vortex anti vortex pair. What is anti vortex? Anti vortex is a pole of gap, not a zero. In the upper half plane, the gap must be analytic. It doesn't have any pole. So as long as the vortex is here, it cannot disappear because there's, again, it either goes to infinity. Or it has to do something to accumulate anti vortex, and there is no anti vortexes anywhere here. So then the question is how transition happens? First of all, what is transition? Transition is this. I need to quickly go back and say, yeah, it looks like plus minus solution, but as all of these problems, as I try to say, these are threshold problems. If you take coupling lambda the same and stop and just start putting this interaction up, up, up. At the end of the day, you'll get a negative constant, sorry, positive constant. There will be no superconductivity at all. So you need a particular deep of the interaction in order to be able to get this plus minus solution. And for fixed coupling lambda, if you change the ratio of these two frequencies, or you keep the ratio of the frequency the same and change coupling lambda, doesn't matter. Either way, you will eventually come to a situation when the system is no longer sustains this plus minus solution and it becomes normal state. And the question, last question that I want to address is how this transition happens. By all numerics and also analytics, the position of zero goes to zero as a transition. So this point and this point merge with each other. Very good. And then you ask a question, uh, what happens when you want to go from the other side and see how uh, superconductivity emerges. Long story short, it emerges exactly like in BKT theory of, of two-dimensional superconductivity or whatever, breaking U1. When these two guys come close, they approach zero frequency. 
And at the same time, there are two anti-vortices that live in the lower half plane come to the same point. And at the transition, there is a binding of the vortex and anti-vortex, which if I review, uh, rewind it differently, as the system emerges in the superconducting state, it emerges because of unbinding of vortex anti vortex pairs at zero frequency. And then after unbinding, anti vortices, poles go into lower half plane while zeros move along Matsubara axis. So it's really vortex anti vortex unbinding. And what is nice here is that you can write down formulas, which I probably don't bother writing here, that really shows where the poles are, where the zeros are. And you can really see this in real time. Okay, so this is element of topology here. Okay, I think I'm done. And let me flash the conclusions. And conclusions basically is going back to first part. That if you ask what gives eventually superconductivity in case of repulsive interaction. It started with con Lattinger story. It evolved, but we still qualitatively use the same wording, namely, we start with repulsive interaction. We want to screen this repulsive interaction from contribution from particle hole channel. And it turns out that when we screen them, we, we most cases we find the channel which becomes attractive. It either becomes attractive instantly if we start with Hubbard U, or it becomes attractive after we do this screening and screening has to overcome the threshold. And I gave you example, RG shows how this threshold emerges. And then all this non-BCS pairing, also threshold phenomena. It also shows how threshold emerges. And final example also has a threshold. So in all cases, the all examples that I gave you, there is a threshold for the pairing. Either it develops or it doesn't develop, but it always develops because we do something with the interaction. Either we create attractive component in momentum space, or we make interaction frequency dependent and allow this sign changing solution as a function of frequency. And I guess with this, I'm done. Thanks. Just very simple question of uh, the old generation. Uh, so uh, the last part of your talk. So you um, seem to say that all this Macmillan picture where there is lambda of attraction and then uh, too much of logarithm of uh, Coulomb repulsion uh, uh, reduced by too much of logarithm, that this is just myth and this is not uh, what uh, So uh, in, uh, is there any region where this old maximum picture is still weighed? So mm -hmm. you, uh, you are talking only about strong enough interest. Uh, no, I'm, I need to say more accurately what I'm saying. The results, if you look at the results at the end of the day, the results are all correct. It's a question about interpretation. And interpretation goes this way. If you want to interpret the result as repulsion translates into attraction, I will be very uh, vigorously opposed to this interpretation because repulsion is repulsion. However, if you want to say that this interaction, I roughly put it like this, and I approximate it just like two different interactions. As a result, two different gaps. Let's call delta one here, delta two here. And I write equation delta one is something delta one plus something delta two and do the same for delta two. If interaction is repulsive all the time, but if I eliminate this guy from the equations, means I do RG, I integrate over this energy and I write down effective interaction in for delta one only, this is where you get all this Macmillan stuff. And this is where you can interpret the result as effective attraction. There will be solution for delta one, and delta one will be equal to delta one. And here it will be minus Coulomb interaction U divided by one plus U times log plus electron phonon. This is your Macmillan stuff. But only after you integrate this part. And if you don't, this is your interaction. So in terms of interaction, it's always repulsive. In terms of splitting into two parts and integrating one part, you get effective interactions that you can interpret as attractive. 
Yeah, but it seems that for, for, for a given system, uh, you cannot just integrate, right? So you, this is why I'm saying that you need to start with, with you need theory. to deal, you don't split into two, you need to solve yeah. the full so, equation. Yes. Yeah. So in some sense, this is not on the interpretation, this is some result on the average solution. Yes, but you, you ask, is there a limit when this interpretation is, when this result result is right? Yes, of course, when there is a big logarithms and a weak coupling, then the result is right. But again, only as only after you integrate out high energies. All I'm opposing is the wording that goes into textbooks that somehow you convert repulsion into attraction. You don't convert repulsion into attraction. Interaction remains repulsive at all frequencies. Any other questions? Yes. I just want to First of all, very nice talk. Thank you. Uh, are there experimental consequences of having complex exponents? Yes, yes, there are. If you look at, but there are in terms of okay, so the easiest, exper the easiest uh, experimental consequence. If you plot density of states, as a function of frequency, yes, there is a gap. And then it starts doing like this. And the larger are, the more complex are the exponents, the larger are this, look, this amplitude of this fluctuation. The end result is a crazy situation with a bunch of delta functions instead of continuum. This is one result. Second is that exponent here is not one half. One half is BCS result. There is anomalous exponent close to the threshold. Yeah. But the easiest is, of course, this variation that you see in density of state. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. We went back. In order of which the hands went up. Yeah, it's probably somewhat relating to the previous discussion. It's not kind of the question. So if you don't have phonons whatsoever, just Coulomb interactions themselves, in the lower frequency subspace, they can lead to pairing. You don't need phonons for that. Just if you simply call homogeneous electron gas, do RPA, you will immediately see a call large enough RS. It's already as wave superconducting. Which means phonons are not required for the frequency dependence, which are they? You are saying, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, this is what you are saying is related to this plasmonic mechanism of the pairing, essentially. No, no, I mean that you start getting, I agree with you. So uh, I have to be more careful in the thing. If you, you're saying that even if you start with Hubbard and start dressing it, you start picking up frequency dependence. And if you are lucky, you pick up frequency dependence when the gap is. I don't know how generic is this, but uh, I agree with you. You pick up frequency dependence and it's not guaranteed that you will get a minimum at, at small frequencies. Sorry? That you get a minimum at... at, at... Right, right, but I guess... It... I guess, but it gets still the interaction is the largest at zero frequency. And then it goes down as a function of frequency. Yeah. <laughs> no, small omega, not Q. Um, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you go down and it drops to the complete screen and the answer. It's very small now. It's yes, it's and a couple of squares. and from very large to very small. And but very large at, at small at small frequencies. Still very, very, very large, large at small at high frequencies and very small at low frequencies. Oh, that's what you are saying. It's unscreened for finite frequencies. It's four okay. Square, okay. Okay. Square. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Finite frequencies cannot screen from radio. Okay. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. I had a, a general question about the spin fluctuation picture, which is that uh, as written down, it seems as if the spins that are fluctuating come from the same degrees of freedom as the electrons that Cooper paired. Yes. In 
in the other materials like the iron nictides, mm -hmm. there are different degrees of freedom. And if I conceptually think about the, the crossover when the magnetism is not derived from itinerant fermions, but some species of fermions which are mm -hmm. going a trans mm -hmm. uh, crossover from itinerant magnetism to local magnetism, mm -hmm. does mm -hmm. anything break down in this the kind of equations that you write down, the spin fluctuation mechanism as you go towards the local moment regime of the magnetism? What breaks down is this. Um, this all, it's a good question. I should have mentioned this. Uh, part of the story here is where this interaction one over omega to power of gamma appears. It appears because your bosons are Landau over them. How they are Landau over them depends on whether it's Q equal to zero instability or finite Q instability, but in all cases, they are Landau over them. Landau over them means that even if you start with some original, say, spin fluctuation coming from different electrons, and you have a sharp spectrum with poles in the bosonic susceptibility, if you couple them to electrons, this approach assumes that if you couple them to electrons, that you go to frequencies at which Landau dumping will be larger than any bare dynamics that you put in. And assumption here is that the action happens at this frequency. The temperature, instability temperatures that you get and the boundary scale for self and non fermi liquid and self energy, scale G that I put in, is the smaller than the one at which, it's actually within the range where Landau dumping is stronger than the bare dynamics of the bosons that you start with. If it's not, then the whole theory has to be done differently. Then you have to start and do everything with bare dynamics of the boson. Then, of course, it will be different theory. Yeah. Any questions in the chat? Yes, there's one in the chat. Let's do that. Uh, this is from and he said, do I understand correctly your last reasoning? If we have a discontinuity kink in the effect interaction, so we may have a kink oscillation in the Fourier transformation in which we can have the same phenomena occurring in Fourier oscillation. This may do the same attraction. Uh, no, I don't think that. It's a little bit stretch of interpretation. Uh, it is similar in some sense, but I would not relate this kind of kink to Friedel oscillation because still Friedel oscillation is real space, right? And this is just frequency domain. So yes, you can think about analog of Friedel oscillation frequency domain, but this will bring us too far, probably. Here's another one which will take uh, 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 Chung Hu's in Taiwan. Uh, your fermion boson approach seems to assume the SDW fluctuations arising from the fluctuations of the long range antiferromagnetic order. In Kubrates, however, one popular view is Anderson's RBB scenario, where the short range antiferromagnetic RBB may get both condensed and lead to D wave superconductivity when the charge motion is coherent. Can you comment on this? Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's another good point, of course. Look, uh, it goes like, <coughs> like this. Uh, there is a scale G and the scale of bandwidth. If the scale of G is smaller or comparable to bandwidth, they exist. If the scale of G is much larger than the bandwidth, go to a different scenario. I can we actually we thought we were working about crossover from one to another. It exists, but I didn't talk about it. Yeah. So short answer is yes, you are right. There is another limit when uh, the approach, the, at least initial approach, is totally different. But then you have to judge for yourself uh, what is the cooperate story, whether coupling and bandwidth is uh, which one is much larger. Charge transfer gap is 1.7 electron volt which is the scale for the interaction. Bandwidth is 8T, T is 0.4 electron volts, so 8T is about three. So bandwidth, three electron volt, interaction is close to two electron volt. The rest is just to 
put the numbers in. Yeah. It's so this goes back to the age old debate between Slater, yeah, Mott and Anderson, yeah, about local moments versus inerrancy. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. Both of you very good point to end this marvelous talk. Thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. <laughs>